Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar session. Uh, my, my name is Marina Sinken. I'm the Making Fun and Frog for Africa Partnership Coordinator. And uh, it is my pleasure to moderate uh, this session today. So if we can move to the next slide presenting the agenda of the session, as you can see, uh, during the, the webinar, we will present uh, the, the, the main insight for the finance in Africa report. Then we will have a lunch table with all our panelists, and then we will have a, a question and answer session. So before we start, please let me uh, remind you some housekeeping rules. So this is a one hour webinar, included, uh, including the question and answer. So all participant microphones uh, are disabled, and uh, we will kindly ask you to remain muted during the webinar. You can submit your questions either using the Q&A button or by raising your hand. The presentation will be in English with a simultaneous translation in French. And uh, as always, we will share with you the slide and the recording of the presentation within uh, 72 hours following the webinar. The, the recording and slide will also be available on our website. We can, can see the name on the, of, on the, web, of the website on the slide. Uh, please send a message to the organizer if you are facing any technical issues. And uh, we will also ask you to not forget to complete the questionnaire at the end of the session. It will automatically appear on your profile. So uh, for those who are here to, to follow us, this is the 10th and the last webinar of the year of the webinar series, delivered in, in collaboration with Making Planners Work for Africa, IPC, OVOS, EICD Consortium. And uh, it's part of the EIB Technical Assistance Financial Sector Program for Western Central Africa. So Making Finance Work for Africa, which I am the partnership coordinator, is a partnership uh, supported by the donors we can see on the slide, uh, with the aim to promote uh, the African financial sector through knowledge management and application. And uh, the EIB Technical Assistance uh, Financial Sector a program in Western South Africa aims to improve uh, responsible financial inclusion and uh, make finance uh, easily accessible to SMEs uh, especially. So now before we start with the, with the presentation, let me take uh, some minutes to welcome, uh, thank you and introduce our speakers today. So the presentation of the report, Finance in Africa, Navigating the Financial Landscape in Turbulent Times, will be performed by Colin Birmingham, which is a senior economist in the country and financial sector analysis division at the European Investment Bank. As part of his responsibilities, Colin uh, coordinates and significantly contributes to the EIB Finance in Africa report he will present today, uh, the version for 2022. Then as I just said, we will have a, a round table with uh, three panelists, Mrs. Josephine Anan Ankobar, Dr. Kenneth Eseka and uh, Mr. Kwame Nadeke. Uh, Mrs. Josephine Anan Ankoma is the Group Chief Executive Officer at Ecobank Group, and uh, she's exercising great responsibility for the commercial banking operation of Ecobank in 33 countries across Africa. Her work focuses on creating relevant solutions to help build African SMEs and uh, local corporates and positioning them to become viable and sustainable. Dr. Kenneth Efeka is uh, a director within the Deputy Government Governor Office of the Bank of Uganda, and he's currently involved in work related with ESG, sustainability, big data analytics, and the uh, innovation hub. And uh, finally, Mr. Kwame Nadeke is the CEO of the Development Bank of Ghana. He has more than 30 years of experience in leadership roles across different geographies, including Ghana, the UK, and Asia. And Mr. Duque has particular experience of leading major foreign exchange technology platforms and treasury. 
So without further ado, we will start the webinar with the presentation. And uh, I will leave the floor to Pauline for the presentation. Thank you, Wayne. Enjoy. <clears throat> Thank you, Marina. And uh, let me express my uh, pleasure of being here today to, to share some of the, the results of the, the final Finance in Africa 2022 report. I'd like to, to thank our, our colleagues at Making Finance Work for Africa for, for hosting the event. And also on the uh, behalf of the EIB, I'd like to um, thank the, uh, the illustrious speakers for, for joining. Uh, I look forward to the, uh, the panel discussion later. Slide, please. So the report of 2022 is the, the seventh in the series. Um, it covers banking, microfinance, digitalization, uh, climate and, and gender. And if you're uh, interested in the results today and you want to learn a bit more, we, uh, we have a lot more detail in the report, obviously, so I, uh, I would recommend that you, uh, you, you can check it out on our, on our website. So the, the cornerstone of the report is a, is a survey of 70 uh, banks in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And that represents about 30% uh, of uh, banking sector assets in the, in the region. The, the survey was carried out this year um, between you know, April and, and kind of late May, early June. So it was after the, uh, the Russian in, invasion of Ukraine. So the, the impact of the war um, had already begun to, to shape the perceptions of the, of the banks in the, in the survey. But of course, the, you know, the, the global tightening and financial conditions which followed the war continued to intensify um, after the survey. So, so that's worth um, bearing in mind. Uh, slide, please. So we, we won't go into a great deal of detail on the on the macro given the, the time constraints, but one thing I think which is worth uh, you know uh, looking at is the you know the situation facing the, the sovereign in, in sub-Saharan Africa, given the, the links between the, the sovereign and the and, and the banking sector. So if you look at the chart there on the left, um, you know, what you can see is that, for example, uh, following the pandemic, uh, there was a, a sharp increase in uh, credit default swaps rates for uh, the sovereigns in, in sub-Saharan Africa. But even though they, they increased quite sharply, they also tended to, to dissipate, you know, um, relatively quickly uh, after, after the pandemic. Uh, what we saw in contrast, you know, following the, uh, the invasion of uh, Ukraine was that the, um, the increase in, in these uh, CDS spreads was, was a bit more gradual, but, but it's also being a bit more persistent. So it's kind of staying at a, at a higher level for, for longer. And another way to, to kind of think about the, the stress facing uh, sovereigns is to, to look at uh, sovereign debt servicing costs as a percentage of, of government revenue, which is the, the chart on the, on the right there. And these debt servicing costs have been increasing by virtue of both um, higher debt levels um, for sovereigns, you know, since the start of the pandemic. If we uh, look at debt service as a, as a uh, percentage of uh, GDP, I think it's about 56% of GDP in, in sub-Saharan Africa at the moment, which is the, the highest that we've seen for, for 20 years, you know, going back to the, the period uh, just before the, the HIPAA debt relief allowed the, uh, the debt ratio to, to fall quite substantially. But if we care, compare the, the kind of the, the high debt ratios that we're looking at today compared to, to what we saw before HIPAA, um, the composition of debt is a bit less favorable for the, for the sovereigns right now in the sense that there's less concessional borrowing, uh, you know, there's a lot more private sector creditors, um, so that's increasing uh, borrowing costs and, and making debt workouts more more difficult for, for countries that find themselves in trouble. So the combination of, of higher debt and, and higher interest rates due to, to tighter financial conditions um, means that, you know, debt servicing costs um, in, in Africa are, sub-Saharan Africa are both higher and, and rising more faster than in other regions. So you can see that from the, the black line in the chart there. So. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like there's, you know, any uh, immediate relief coming in terms of the, um, the, the pressures on, um, you know, debt sustainability. Slide, please. So one of the, the things that we ask the, the banks in the, in the survey is, you know, what are the issues that are, are concerning them? And uh, this is what we see in the, in the chart on the left. So one thing that we, we saw this year uh, which we hadn't seen last year, was banks concerned about uh, the cost of funding in, in local currency. So over half of banks were worried about that this year, whereas it, it barely featured in the in the survey in, in 2021. And of course, you know, with the um, 
you know, we can understand why with, you know, central banks uh, raising, you know, domestic interest rates to, to kind of to deal with inflation um, and with those kind of tighter, um, you know, global financial conditions, making it more expensive for, for banks to, to issue uh, bonds. Uh, we see this uh, big increase in, um, you know, banks concerned about the, the cost of, of local currency funding. Now, you know, typically a, a high interest rate environment can be, you know, uh, supportive of uh, bank profits because it allows an expansion in, um, in net interest margins. But in the in the current environment, I think banks face a, a, a difficult condition, or, you know, a difficult uh, situation in terms of um, how they, you know, how they price their assets, how they price their, their loans to, to customers, because if they decide to, to try and pass through these, um, you know, higher funding costs that they're that they're facing, um, you know, it may eventually just push up uh, NPLs because obviously uh, consumers are facing, um, you know, drops in, in real incomes and uh, corporates are also, um, you know, facing uh, pressures, pressures on margins. So um, it's, it's, it's difficult for them to, you know, it's a difficult, I guess, trade-off. And one of the, you know, one of the other concerns that banks still have is this issue in terms of the fall of, uh, you know, fall in asset quality of the, of the portfolio. It's not quite the the dominant concern that it was back in, in 2021, but it's, you know, it's still an issue for a lot of banks. Um, and if we look at the kind of the, the chart at the right, which is showing, um, you know, NPL ratios by, by firm type, um, and not just NPLs, in fact, also, uh, you know, moratorium and, and, and restructuring. Um, and it's kind of broken down between SMEs and corporates. So, for example, if you look at the, you know, the, the first bar at the top there, for uh, SMEs with NPLs, the, the red portion of the bar there with the 41. What that's saying is 41% of the banks in our, in our survey uh, report that more than 10% of their uh, SME loan book is, is classified as, as non-performing. So you, what you can see is there's a very uh, distinct difference between uh, the asset quality of SMEs uh, and, and corporates. Uh, asset quality is far more, far more challenging for, for SMEs. And it's not just MPLs. Obviously, there's issues in terms of moratorium restructuring. So, um, so asset quality does uh, remain a concern. And then SMEs, you know, they also face additional structural issues when they're when they're trying to access finance, uh, such as you know collateral constraints and uh, you know uh, a weak or a poor credit history, things that don't affect uh, larger firms to the to the same extent. Slide, please. And another question then we ask is, you know how banks are uh, expecting to, to tighten their, their lending standards, uh, which is the, the chart here on the left. So when we, when we asked this question in 2021, um, you know, banks were expecting to be broadly neutral in terms of um, credit standards, in the sense that you had a similar amount of banks that were expecting to, to tighten lending standards versus uh, loosen. Now, in the end, uh, what transpired is banks actually tightened lending standards quite considerably in uh, in 2021, um, and that was on the back of a uh, of another uh, notable tightening in, in 2020, and once again in, in 2022, a further tightening in lending standards is expected. So we're talking about uh, you know three consecutive years of uh, tightening lending standards. So that's you know that is making it uh, you know more difficult for for firms to to access credit. Having said that, 89% um, of banks in the in the survey, uh, you know, wished to expand operations in, in 2022, which was uh, a bit higher than than what we had seen in 2021. But of course, you know, risk appetite may have um, diminished a bit, you know, between the the time that the that the survey has taken place and um, uh, where we stand uh, where we stand now. So these kind of tightening and credit standards could be one issue. Um, you know, constricting the, the flow of credit to the private sector. Um, another would be, um, you know, the kind of the crowding out by banks uh, holding increasing amounts of uh, public debt. So the, the chart on the right there shows um, banks' claims on, on central government as a percentage of their, their total bank assets. So all of the, uh, you know, the, the countries there in the, in the chart, the, the banking sector holds more than uh, Twenty percent of its assets in terms of uh, you know public sector liabilities, up to nearly forty percent for the for the countries on the right. And unfortunately, the you know this kind of link between the uh, the banking sector and the, uh, the the public sector tends to be stronger in countries where 
you know, the public sector is, say, less credit worthy. So, for example, if you look at all the countries in the chart there, with the exception of um, Egypt, if they have a credit rating, um, it's C um, or lower, um, or if they don't have a credit rating because they don't issue, uh, you know, debt on capital markets, um, you know, they are, are risk that high risk of, of debt distress by the MF or, or in debt distress. Um, so you have this, um, you know, this kind of concern where the, you know, there's large exposure to um, sovereigns that have uh, deteriorating uh, credit worthiness. Chart, please. Yeah, sorry, slide, please. Now, we also ask some uh, thematic questions in the report. One is on, on gender. Um, what we see in the report is 70% of the banks in the, in the survey um, have a gender strategy. And that's an increase of 10% on the, on the previous year. So, so banks are, are really kind of stepping up here in terms of their efforts on uh, gender finance. And about 60% of banks have financial services, which are, are targeted specifically um, at women. And we can see a clear incentive, um, you know, for this in the sense that we ask banks, you know, is there a difference on the uh, rate of non-performing loans on, on female loans com compared to male loans? Um, you know, and this is kind of in the, you know, mainly in the, 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 the business sector. And what we see is that more than 40% um, of banks see uh, lower NPL ratios on uh, female loans. So, and about 30% see, see no difference. So, um, you know, there seems to be higher asset quality on the, on the female portfolio. And in some countries, um, you know, that difference is even larger. For example, in the case of Nigeria, 70% uh, of banks say they observe lower NPL rates on, on female loans. Slide, please. Uh, we also try to understand, you know, what's happening with banks in terms of their uh, digitalization journeys. Um, and one thing we ask about is the, the impact of, of COVID-19 on, on digitalization. I think banks agree very strongly that the, you know, the pandemic um, accelerated both their inward uh, digital digital transformation, but also their outward one in, 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 the, in the sense of the, you know, the amount of services that have been made available um, online for, for customers. But of course, you know, as you, as you become more digital, then there's also, um, you know, more focus on, um, on cyber security risk. Um, we ask banks, you know, what are the, the obstacles to, to doing more on, on digitalization? Um, and that kind of cybersecurity risk or, or cybersecurity challenges, uh, you know, very prominent among, uh, you know, the, the concerns of the bank in this area. Uh, similarly, complying with regulatory requirements, things like, you know, know your customer, um, that shows up as a, you know, probably the most uh, pronounced, very severe constraint um, amongst banks, you know, co complying with this issue. Then, you know, there's also issues in terms of like not having the appropriate IT infrastructure or, or lack of funding to, to invest in that. Um, and of course, then we have, um, you know, competition from the, from the fintech sector. So in the, you know, in the report, we, we have a stock take of the, the fintech sector in Africa. What we see is that there were 450 firms operating um, in the sector um, in April of 2020. And if you fast forward two years later to April or 2022, that's gone from 450 firms up to over a thousand firms. So you're talking about very rapid growth. Um, and most of those firms are, are homegrown uh, African firms, 80%, uh, in fact. And competition from, you know, from these fintechs, uh, you know, for some banks is uh, seen as an obstacle to, to doing more, a kind of a deterrent to, to more digitalization. But of course, for other banks, you know, they've, they've seen it as a catalyst and we have banks that, you know, partner or, or invest in fintech. So it's, it's, I think it's very much a kind of a, an individual story, uh, you know, for, for, the, for, the, for the banks. Uh, slide, please. And the final thing I'll, I'll just comment on is uh, climate screening. So we see banks are doing more in terms of uh, screening climate risk. Um, you know, the chart on the left there shows in terms of assessing the portfolio uh, climate risk. We had about 40% of banks doing that in 21. Um, and the amounts doing that in 2022 is, it's only a little bit higher, but there was a really sharp increase in the amount of banks planning to do that. So in terms of intentions, uh, our momentum in terms of uh, climate screaming, I think there's been a real, uh, you know, noticeable momentum uh, in this area. Uh, you know, it's a similar story there in terms of affecting new loans. Uh, again, a, a bit more momentum on that front. 
But if you if you look at the amount of banks that see you know green lending as as an opportunity, which I think is about seventy percent of the the banks in our in our survey, versus those that have actually you know green lending products, which I think is closer to to twenty percent, uh, you know there's a big kind of you know execution gap here between that you know uh, intention or you know that opportunity uh, and what banks have actually done. And for a lot of banks, a lack, a lack of technical capacity is identified as, as a barrier to, to doing more. So 60% of banks say that. And two thirds think that uh, IFIs could you know, do more to help them, IFIs like the, the EIB. So that leaves us with a kind of a clear you know, policy um, you know, message for, for how, the, how the EIB can, uh, can help in terms of uh, you know, doing green lending. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for the, the opportunity to, to present the results and um, you know, please uh, read the report if you want um, any more detail on uh, you know, the, the banking sector or the, the other areas that we, we cover. Thank you. I'll hand back to you, uh, Marina. Thank you, Colleen, for, for the very insightful presentation. And uh, now we will uh, open the floor to, to our panelists. And uh, so as the title of the report uh, <clears throat> states, uh, we are navigating in very turbulent times. So we have seen uh, another tumultuous year so far in 2022. So my, my first question will be for you, Mrs. Anan Ankoba. Uh, during, uh, given the, the difficulty of the, the current economic and uh, operating uh, environment we are evolving in, where, what do you see as the most uh, important changes and trends in the banking sector this year? Thank you very much for the question, Marina. And I think I'll quickly speak through four key trends uh, or developments that we see um, from our end across um, our 33 affiliates in Africa. Definitely, the, um, and obviously, the geopolitical tensions emanating from the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, continues to dominate discussions in our economic environment. Uh, we see markets all over the world experiencing supply chain disruptions and increases in, in production costs. And furthermore, we are seeing um, increases in um, energy prices um, resulting from um, the sanctions against Russian um, oil, oil exports and, and the impact of this on food security and on agricultural costs. So in, in most of, the, of our markets, we see the impact of this crisis um, filter through in the form of increasing inflationary pressures and macroeconomic uncertainty. And um, the key inherent drivers of inflation during the, um, um, uh, before the, the, the conflict, that is during the pandemic, which were energy prices and uh, supply chain issues have definitely um, exacerbated. Um, the benign outlook of the pandemic on bank earnings may not continue. Uh, we see that the outlook now is less favorable and we expect to see an increase in provisions for loan losses and um, increased volatility in bank earnings and, and the EIB report alluded to that. We also see what I describe as a shift from bricks to clicks. Um, the shift in digital continues to be one of the most prevalent trends uh, within the banking sector today. And we see in customers increasingly you know, preferring digital solutions. There's a growing trend for data collection and improved data analytics across the banking sector to support innovation. We also see a strong growth, especially in payment solutions uh, being offered by fintechs. Um, today, when you look at the um, assess the equity valuations of payment service providers, they are significantly um, higher than those of uh, traditional banks. So today, having control of customers coming to you and being able to monetize those customer journeys is where the value is. Disintermediation is a major risk that is beginning to surface with non-banking firms now offering services such as savings, investments, quick loans, and these could encroach on the market share of banks. Um, Third, we are also witnessing an uncomfortable increase in payment frauds and, and criminals are constantly you know, developing new ways of targeting and obtaining monies from, uh, from victims and businesses and individuals who are our clients. And this opens us up to um, operational losses and increases our, the, the operational risk of our operations. Um, authorized push payments frauds today now exceeds card payment frauds. And there's an increase in scams involving the purchase of goods and services, um, sometimes to, um, that are SMEs place orders for that are never delivered. We also see enhanced regulatory um, scrutiny from the central banks within this environment as they, the, the regulator seeks to put measures in place to ensure that banks are adequately capitalized, that we are 
we are we are stable, that we are liquid, and all in a bit to protect um, um, depositors' funds. So there's an increased focus on strengthening the quality and the frequency of regulatory reporting. And the regulator regulator today has zero tolerance for 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 non-compliance, and we see an increase in regulatory fines, you know, um, across our market. Mm -hmm. So having a strong operational risk management culture is paramount in, in banking today to avoid or to mit mitigate these operational um, losses. Finally, um, environmental and social, environmental, social and governance issues are top of mind today. Uh, we see that banks are under pressure to relook our lending portfolios, and uh, we see a gradual focus on sustainable lending or green green financing, uh, um, which um, uh, Colin also alluded to. Other topics beyond climate change, such as diversity, you know, gender balance, inclusion, are taking center stage, and there's a grip and there's growing pressure on banks to realign our lending habits and gauge how ethical our investments are and and, and the services that we are provided. We are providing so it's, it's critical today in the midst of um, all of these uh, changes and all of these trends um, for us as banks to adapt quickly um, to the requirements of the industry to the requirements of the market to the requirements of our of our customers to ensure that we stay resilient and uh, our businesses continue to be scalable and future proof thank you very much marina Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fanan and Kuma. You raised uh, a lot of, of points, and we will have the opportunity to come back uh, on some of these. I want to bounce back on what, what you said about the regulatory scrutiny. So we, we have the chance to have uh, Dr. Egesa from, from the Bank of Uganda. And as we can imagine, uh, the, the current uh, macroeconomic context is a, a concern for, for the regulators and the bank extension as well. So Dr. 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 Egesa, can I ask you, uh, given all that is happening, what do you see as the most important uh, economic policy challenges for central banks Africa in Africa? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marina, and thank you for the presentation, Colin, and uh, the previous speaker. Uh, for the central banks, the most important thing remains reigning in inflation. Uh, this is the number one priority especially since looking at the current round of inflation is mainly, it has been mainly driven by products in the consumption basket that hurt the poorest most. Uh, partly mainly because uh, they are, a large part of their incomes are spent on these items. So the challenge is to address inflation. Unfortunately, the policy tool of choice is the interest rate. And we know that uh, uh, the use of the interest rate has side effects. It hurts growth, which is already weak given what's happening in the global economy. So we expect that in the short to medium term, uh, growth will continue to be lukewarm and we may see NPLs increasing. However, an important point to make here is that uh, compromising on the inflation objective could have much longer term, much more painful effects in the longer term. And that's why ensuring that inflation is uh, addressed over the short to the medium term is very important. The second challenge is an associated challenge, which is on the domestic exchange rate. Given the developments uh, in the international economy arising from the Russia-Ukraine effect, uh, tightening of policy in the developed world, uh, lukewarm global demand. Uh, we can't we can't escape having issues with our uh, domestic exchange rates. So, an important an important policy challenge for central banks is to see how to minimize volatility in the exchange rate market because ultimately this also leads into inflation, especially for imported goods. So this is another important uh, uh, consideration for central banks uh, that we need to address. Uh, the other one is to do with uh, how to balance the pressures from the fiscal side, because we know in, in the situation such as this, fiscal is always on the other side trying to address some of the, uh, the pains that are faced in the economy. And unfortunately, because of what's happening in the global economy, what's happening to 
uh, interest rates uh, that are being tightened in developing countries, uh, shortages in liquidity. It means that uh, fiscal has to turn to domestic financial markets for financing. And this puts further pressures on interest rates and also crowds out the private sector. So these are some of the challenges that central banks need to address. How you coordinate with the fiscal to, to, to ensure that the policy objectives of the central bank are, are addressed. The second priority, the second major priority is of course ensuring financial sector stability. And as already alluded to, in an environment where prices are rising, interest rates are going up, uh, demand both in the domestic and the global economy is being impacted, uh, performance of businesses uh, is undermined and borrow, borrowing, borrowings by those businesses turn into NPLs. So this is an issue that is quite important for central banks to keep an eye on. And so monitoring credit quality closely is uh, something that's very important for, for central banks in Africa going forward. However, on the positive side, uh, we are coming from a situation where banks had an opportunity to build some buffers during the COVID period, especially given some of the incentives and programs that were set up uh, as relief measures during COVID. So we are not coming from a very bad place, although uh, unfortunately there are still some sectors. If you look at NPLs on aggregate basis, it's not yet too bad. But if you dig further and look at certain specific sectors, then you find that uh, some NPLs are rising as a carryover from COVID in sectors like uh, education, but also those that were not greatly impacted during COVID because of the credit relief measures, but are now being impacted by um, the hike in prices such as wholesale and retail are also starting to be affected. So overall, it's not yet a major concern, but on sector basis, there are some trends that are emerging that we need to keep an eye on. I think I'll stop at, at, at that point and, and follow up later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agatha. Indeed, you, you mentioned several times the, the, the NPL situation, and we will we will come back on, on that later. And before we, we do that, I, I want to be in critical terms such as the one we are, we are living in, the role of the Public Development Bank is really important because they have a, a contra-cyclical role uh, by providing finance in the, in the private sector. And uh, so, uh, Mr. Duke, uh, in that sense, can you give us uh, your view on the complementarities between uh, public development banks such as the, the Development Bank of Ghana uh, and the commercial banks? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So the bottom line is that we see ourselves as crisis partners. And clearly, the Belmont Bank, as you said, plays a counter-cyclical role. And Ghana is a great example because we're in the middle of an economic crisis at the moment. We've recently experienced high inflation, 40 to 50%, constant depreciation around the same level, even though this week there's been some uh, pullback because of the staff agreement with the IMF. And um, the end result is that the government is being unable to enter access to capital markets. So while the IMF program that we're going through at the moment is to help implement public spending reforms, reduce subsidies, and create greater transparency, the end result is that it has a direct negative impact on the livelihood of our businesses. Uh, particularly local businesses in the country. And so our role as one of the key providers of liquidity, particularly long-term uh, financing in the local currency becomes particularly uh, critical. And while the government is looking at probably the next two to three years of austerity, at the very least, we have to provide that spark, that, that engine while we can have provide to the, uh, the local businesses the ability to continue operating and grow and thrive in very difficult uh, conditions. So just as a quick example, what are we doing? Um, we've set up as a development bank an emergency economic program, um, which has been put together in terms of focusing on food security in particular, 
the hydrogen business in general. Um, and in that respect, we're looking to provide uh, loans, again, long-term loans at very concession rates that allow businesses to continue to grow and thrive. The good news from that is because we set it up very professionally and because we set it up uh, with our own money to kick off, we now have our development partners joining us uh, to use the same program and enhance that program. So we're looking at, at the moment, we started with about $37 million, uh, and now we're doubling that and we're probably looking to expand that again because of the, the, the track record that we set with that spend. So, I mean, the point that you raised is just critical. And if, if we don't have development banks at this time, then really we're going to see a lot more local businesses um, founder and fail. And that is now where we have to step up to the plate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Decker. And now if uh, one, one of the, the key insight from, from the presentation uh, made by Colleen is, uh, you know, the, the SME finance, uh, which is an important and kind of recurrent, uh, recurrent uh, issue in the African uh, finance sector. And uh, as we can observe that the, 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 the financing gap SMEs um, are facing is uh, is even more important in time of crisis. And uh, Mr. Decker, on these specific issues of, uh, of SME, how uh, the Development Bank, does the Development Bank of Ghana engage with uh, financial institution? And uh, do you observe the same problems of SMEs um, in terms of accessing finance that we do in our survey, meaning lack of collateral, poor credit history, et cetera? And uh, that's a, a very long question. And what is your opinion uh, will be the best, uh, the, the most effective tools to deal with these challenges? Uh, you've hit a very critical point. And um, it's not just about financing, and we're finding that out. So while we're providing direct financing, as we said earlier, you see that the what we're calling technical assistance is actually even more important. And what we have is a situation which I think is uh, common in many countries, um, developing and developed, where you have banks complaining about the local business, particularly the smaller ones, that they're not ready for finance, they don't have the documentation, they don't pay back their loans, et cetera, et cetera. And then you hear the same cry uh, in reverse from our local businesses and our SMEs in particular, the banks are too bureaucratic, uh, they want every single paper, you know, including my uh, marriage certificates and all that. And, uh, and it takes forever to get a loan to get it at all. So a key part of our program is uh, we're working very closely with our central bank and incidentally, the central bank asked the board to build a platform that creates a common understanding and a common nomenclature. Because the only way you're going to get both banks, um, private financial institutions, and the SMEs to work together is when they speak a common language. And at the moment in our country, they are not. And so from the bank side, we're working closely with the banks to set up common underwriting terms, which are then codified on the platform to allow everybody to understand clearly what are the requirements for the banks. And then we negotiate with the banks to ensure that their requirements are simple, which means they can be codified, and then it becomes pretty much a level playing field in terms of understanding what the banks are looking for. And then we'll work at the same time with the Association of uh, Ghana Industries, we're working with the Ghana Chambers of Commerce, we work with the SMEs again to prepare them and make them ready for those. And again, we're codifying and, and uh, digitizing that process so that it becomes very clear to them what that journey is. And we provide incentives along the way so that you know that if you pass pillar one and you get to pillar two, you get bigger and bigger loans or, or better facilities because you're creating that track record. And so we have what we call five pillars, but I'll just take some time just to go through the first three. The first one is education. And it's education, not just in terms of financial literacy and uh, understanding uh, what the requirements are. It's also education and understanding what the standards are 
which becomes in some cases even sector specific so that there's clear understanding what the standards are in terms of your, your goods and what the market availability is for your goods or your services going forward both locally and internationally this is where the whole uh, connection comes in the second pillar which we're progressing on is not to make the SME into an accountant and a bookkeeper and everything. So I created a platform whereby having the data from the banks and the data from the SMEs and the activities from the SMEs and also government data. Because remember, as a development bank, we have a huge convenient power to bring together banks, SMEs, and government. And as a result, we have all that data. And so you're creating a second pillar where just by providing permission to your peer advice, you automatically get all the required documentation purely because of the activity that you have on the platform. So we are linked into the Ghana Revenue Service, we're linked into uh, a lot of the government databases that allow the SME to provide the required documentation by a click of a button. And that's work in progress at the moment. But again, what we're trying to do is get up to speak the same language of digitization. And then that gives us the ability also because of the activity on that platform for us to begin to give support in terms of cash flow, even before you get to credit. And once you have an understanding of the activity, which is verifiable because of the activity of the platform, the banks find it very easy to then provide the loans on a cash flow basis. And then we get to pillar three, where there's actual credit and credit requests. And this is the platform that we're talking about. And to the point that you're making, this is um, in many ways an experiment. It's trying to break um, this, this problem that we had for a long time. Initial, um, initial prognosis is, is very favorable. And as I said, you know, working together with our development partners to, to basically build this platform. And the point that we're trying to make is that we have to get SMEs and the providers of finance speak in the same language. And the route to that is digitization. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dike. And uh, you mentioned that the importance of the of digitalizing the, the process to make uh, the different services, whether financing or not, very uh, efficient for for, for for the SMEs and uh, we saw in the presentation made by Colleen uh, how the the, <clears throat> the digitalization uh, is uh, progressing in the African banking sector and uh, Mrs. Anan and Koma, we know that EcoBank uh, has been a pioneer among the among the commercial banks in terms of its digitalization journey. And can can you give us an overview of this journey and uh, your view on the interplay between the banks and the fintechs? Yeah, I, I, and before I do that, I just want to briefly align myself with uh, Mr. Duca's comments in terms of how we face um, SMEs, that the solution does not only lie with providing them with financial um, solutions, but also looking at the non-financial. And at EcoBank, we are very focused in terms of training. Uh, we, we approach our SMEs on three pillars, access to capabilities, access to markets, and then access to finance in that order. So um, we, we, we do offer a lot of training um, um, for our, our SMEs in order to upskill them and ensure that they are being effective in the way that they are managing um, their, their businesses. Uh, back to the question on, you know, EcoBank and our digital journey. I think that we recognized a long time uh, quite earlier on that in order for us to remain re resilient and relevant to, you know, to the space that we operate in, we had to embrace um, technology. So right back in 2002, we established our, our technology hub, a centralized operations and technology hub that serves um, all of uh, our 33 affiliates. Uh, we further seized the opportunity to develop a technology stack um, through APIs to facilitate partnerships in the digi digital financial services space. And the objective of that journey was to ensure that we were, we were scalable. You know, we are in 33 markets and we need to ensure that the route to market, you know, and the cost to serve is low. So it's key to ensure that we, escape, we, escape, we remain scalable and um, are able to offer relevant and and convenient services uh, to our customers. Um, the, the, our our, our Pan-African uh, platform is able to serve um, uh, 
as uh, 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 our customers across all of our affiliates and has attracted uh, partnerships with um, telcos such as MTN and Airtel and has helped with the development of the mobile money um, ecosystem. Um, additionally as well, um, we've become the preferred bank for fintechs to facilitate the development of value added services you know, within, within this space. And we made this bold statement in digital services, um, digital financial services by, by the launch of the Ecobank mobile app in, 26, um, um, in, in the year 2016. And it is one app that is applicable in, in four languages across 33 markets in, in Africa, providing seamless you know, uh, payments um, in, in African currencies across all of these markets. We, through the, through this uh, platform, we have peer to, we're able to do peer to peer transfers. You know, agent services through our Express Points, um, KYC Light account opening for you know a mass market consumers, um, and interoperability with mobile wallets, and a host of and a host of um, other things. Um, we are also very bullish on you know working with fintechs. We see them as partners and not as competition. That is our view um, in EcoBank and 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 our show of commitment to this sector um, is with the launch of our, the Ecobank FinTech Challenge in, in, 20, um, in 2017. Um, with this Ecobank FinTech Challenge, what we do is to identify, you know, up and coming FinTechs across our markets, work with them, you know, to provide relevant solutions to our, our, our customers. And the winners are provided with mentorship, with, with cash prizes, and with an ability to roll out their products, you know, across all of our 33 markets. And we're currently working with a number of them in all of our markets. Today, in addition to um, um, MTN Mobile Money and Airtel, uh, we can boast of partnerships with fintechs such as Flutterwave, Opay, Interswitch, you know, Jumo, Paga, several of them, Celluland, Jumia, all of them working together with us. So uh, we see uh, fintechs really as partners. We believe that plugging into them and plugging them into the platform that we have created across 33 markets enable, enable us to better serve. Um, it, it gives us speed to market and it causes us to be more efficient and, and makes us more relevant in the continent that we are operating in. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Nenankoma, for sharing uh, this journey and uh, an example of collaboration between commercial banks and, and fintechs. Uh, so my, my last question, uh, because I'm aware of the time, so besides the, the digitalization, the, the report also had that other positive trends, if I can say that, in the sector. Uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the banking groups are more focused and interested in land, in uh, gender granting and in green lending. So my last question will be for you, Dr. Ezeka, and then we will open the floor to the audience. On the from the policy perspective on these um, issues, so meaning genders and uh, and green lending, could you tell us a bit on the situation in in your country and uh, make some recommendation on the way forward? Thank you very much. Uh, I think from our perspective, um, we are pursuing several initiatives in support of similar objectives to, to on sustainability. And we are looking at it from the angle of inst institutionalizing ESG sustainability in the financial sector. And um, in doing this, we, we, we have started first by conducting a situation analysis on the initiatives that banks are doing. Uh, when we conducted this uh, analysis, we found that different banks were undertaking different initiatives and at, and at different levels. Uh, but overall, we noted that um, the understanding is not the same across banks. The, some products are looked at as ESG products, but they are not really ESG products. Uh, some of the risk measures that should be in place are not available. And so we, we are now working on, on uh, standards, which we plan to share with the supervised financial institutions to provide some kind of guidance on the minimum requirements that we see needed to drive this ESG sustainability agenda. And we believe that uh, once these standards are set out, highlighting some of the basic requirements, do you have strategic objectives, that align to your ESG sustainability? Do you have products? Can, the, can these products result into the goals that 
we are focusing on from the national development perspective and the broader sustainability development goals. Can we aggregate all these uh, initiatives across the banking system and see the impact that supervised financial institutions are doing in this area? So this is where we are heading. And, and I believe that given the importance of ESG sustainability, a number of central banks are starting to consider taking the lead role and not sitting back to wait for the supervised financial institutions to, to do what they can do and come in later to see what's happening. So uh, on digitization, we, we also have uh, very uh, important initiatives that are happening, especially in the payment space. This is where most of the innovation is coming in through FinTech. So we are looking at the regulatory environment, looking at the law. We have introduced uh, regulatory sandboxes where we invite uh, new innovators to uh, innovators to come in and test some of their products without disrupting the market. And interestingly, we are also partnering with some of the the innovators on those products that we see are of strategic importance to to the central bank's uh, role. So this is an interesting time. But of course, there are always those risks: cyber risk, fraud, uh, this this uh, disorganization of certain products. But uh, I think the way forward is to work with the private sector in this area and to provide the regulatory environment to ensure that some of the risks are mitigated up front. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ithika, and thank you to our panelists for the insightful answer to, to the question. Uh, I know we don't have much time left, but uh, we can take some minutes to answer some questions from the audience. Unfortunately, we won't have the time to answer all, all of the questions. Uh, I can see some questions in the chat, in the Q&A. So <clears throat> one question. Are the traditional banks still only lend to SMEs against hard collateral as security, or are they open to alternative form of lending? Example, supply chain financing, where, whereby invoices are used as security and payment is made by off-taker buyers. Um, I, I would start with that. Um, I, I think that, you know, um, for banks that understand how how to deal with SMEs, um, you you would quickly understand that if you want to treat them as a corporate, it's it's, a, it's it's when you start not being able to meet their needs. So of course, developing products that ride on the back of cash flows that you can ring fence is how you lend to them, and and that is how we do it um, at, at EcoBank, where you look at what they are doing and who they are supplying to or who they are providing uh, producing for. And, and ensure that you can ring fence that payment. And then on the back of that invoice, you can lend. And, and what you do, what we can we do as well is to work with development finance um, um, institutions to provide credit guarantee schemes that make um, um, the collateral requirements extremely light, you know, especially when in agen under agenda financing program elevates by EcoBank, we have, you know, um, risk sharing facilities that allow us to lend. With, a, with an 80 20 coverage ratio where you just will re require sometimes 20 or 10 percent you know of collateral from from the customer so banks have progressed away from you know being stuck in this mode of provide me with collateral or I can lend to you and are gradually moving towards cash flow lending lending on the backs of receivables invoices that we can prove that we can verify that we can lend against. Thank you, Mrs. Fernand Koma. Uh, I think we have a, a, a raised hand. Alain Stefan, you can give the floor to the to the one uh, raising his or her hand to ask his or her question, please. It's Fel Felicia Moni, I think. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Go ahead. Okay. Of a very um, wonderful uh, session. I enjoyed every presentation, then the report. But the question I want to ask um, is as regards the report and uh, what Josephine mentioned in her presentation, and that has to do with digital financial services. The report, I, I don't know if uh, it covered the, the, the digital divide between the rural dwellers and the uh, urban dwellers. Because you see that this 
financial, digital financial services being emphasized by countries and cashless uh, economy. Those in the rural areas are, are highly, um, um, maybe may um, that, 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 that not getting the, well, what the, the real services they should be getting for a lot of reasons, first knowledge and others. So first, the report, um, does the report have any, any question on that? And what Josephine mentioned on the collaboration between her bank and FinTechs, does that cover rural dwellers? Because two things that I've noticed about the rural dwellers in our own work. First, is uh, financial uh, exclusion that are not included. And if you are not included, you can't even be talking about migrating to uh, digital finance, financial services. So how is EcoBank handling this? And the report, um, does the report cover this aspect of financial services? I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Professor Felicia Mounye, uh, a professor of law, University of Nigeria, and President's Consumer Awareness Organization. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in, in, in terms of the report, we, we don't have a lot of detail on uh, differences in, in, in access to, to finance and financial products between um, urban and, and rural dwellers. I think the area where it probably comes through uh, most in terms of the, the report is we have um, a section on microfinance institutions. And in particular, you know, how the um, I guess how the, the solvency of, of different types of microfinance institutions have, have evolved since the since the onset of the of the pandemic. So what we've observed is that the the larger um, microfinance institutions have kind of fared better in, in, in terms of, of profitability and uh, solvency, whereas uh, you know the smaller ones, which are the, the kind of the tier two or the, the tier three, um, you know, they're they're facing more difficulties in, in, in terms of solvency. And that's, it's also kind of linked to the fact that it's, you know, these uh, financial institutions which have uh, greater reach into the, the kind of the rural and the, um, and the, and the female communities. So these smaller uh, microfinance institutes in some senses uh, on a kind of, uh, you know, relative basis, uh, you know, do more to, to kind of promote uh, financial inclusion um, amongst the, the kind of the, the rural and the, and the female population. So, Obviously, the fact that they face, um, you know, challenges in, in terms of solvency, then you know, risks on doing progress which has been made to date, and you know, in, in terms of um, increasing, um, you know, financial inclusion in in, in those uh, cohorts. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll hand it over uh, back to to Ekebank then for for their response. Thank you. Yes, um, uh, thank you very much, Felicia. You raised very um, interesting points there. Uh, we are cognizant of the fact that, you know, um, we, we need to include um, those in the rural areas um, in our financial um, uh, products to, to make financial products accessible to them. And that's why we are riding on the back of partnerships, especially um, with telcos, um, riding on the back of the USD, USSD um, channels to make sure that they can still you know, um, consumer financial product. They are still able to um, open KYC light accounts using um, um, these channels. Yeah, I mean, today everybody's on WhatsApp. Today everybody has a mobile wallet, and offering that interoperability between a mobile wallet and a bank account. You know, ir irrespective of where you reside, all you need is a phone, and it doesn't have to be a smartphone. You know, a feature phone is still able to do that work. We've extended our services through you know Express Points that allows mom and pop shops. You know all over the countries, all over the communities that we are in to uh, allow customers to deposit money, to allow customers to withdraw money, to allow customers to um, make transfers and, and, and little banking transactions, you know, from, from where they are, you know, in, in, in those communities. It's part of what we are doing to improve financial inclusion across across Africa, and of course, we do have uh, various um, corporate social responsibility um, programs that we also run to educate and to extend. And I, I, I also want to emphasize 
our focus on gender financing through Elevate by Ecobank, which is reaching out to many rural women, providing them with access to financing and providing them with access to training and capacity building and access to markets. So we are cognizant of, of the fact that our market is not only in the cities, but also in the rural areas. And, and in, in our product development, we make sure that through partnerships, we are able to reach out to them, you know, in, in a way that they can consume our, our financial services. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are a little late. We can take maybe one question, but before doing that, I just want to make sure that we the, the panelists are, are available for the next five minutes. Is it okay for you if we could take one more one more question? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, okay, I, I don't think there is any raised hand. Uh, so we can take another question in the chat. We have a question regarding uh, the foreign exchange risk, and it's directly addressed to, to, to you, Mr. Decker, uh, saying the currency depreciation, uh, how do you manage uh, the foreign exchange, rate, uh, foreign exchange rates in the current situation? The question is how do we manage the exchange the, rate? Yes, the foreign exchange risk. The foreign exchange rate. Yeah. Well, that's not, well, to a certain extent, that's not really the role of a development bank because we are the either the victims of uh, what's happening to those events. But, but it's also this is a good question because remember that we have a capital structure in terms of uh, debt and equity. And our equity is very much in the local currency. So, from a um, so from a equity point of view, uh, with current high interest rates, the, the, the bank is doing extremely well. But when you look at it in terms of um, our currency, uh, clearly the depreciation, the rate is um, it's affecting us in that respect. But to the extent that we really use primarily using our, our equity for local operations, uh, we're pretty much insulated with that. So we don't have a mismatch in terms of currency. In terms of the debt, which we see from our lending partners, which is around $600 million, we've taken the approach of A, um, only drawing down what we require, and that has proved very beneficial. So in that respect, um, we only have a small fraction of the debt at any time that is you know, converted into local. So the majority, being a new bank, the majority of our of our online firepower is still being held in platforms. We also were extremely fortunate that beginning of the year we negotiated with EIB, uh, who's one of our key stakeholders. And so we then agreed with them that we should um, about $200 million, just under $200 million, about 175 million euros in uh, our currency. And so it's really looking at the our capital structure and it's really making decisions, long term decisions, but to the long term finance here on how we adjust our currency mix. And our global partners are very supportive in that, in that regard. So we have a good mix of the global currency for operational stuff. The operational activities of our online day, the bulk of it is held in reserve at the moment in hard currency. We'll bring that down when we need it. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Duke. And I think uh, we we will end the QA session now. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we won't be able to answer all your questions, but uh, we will try to, to reach out to you. Uh, Later, as mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you will receive the recording and the slide uh, within 72 hours, and they will also be uh, available on our website. So thank you again to our speakers today, Colin Berminga, Mr. Ananankoma from Ecobank, Mr. Mrs. Sorry, Ananankoma from Ecobank, Mr. Duka from Development, Development Bank of Ghana, and Dr. Isika from uh, Bank of Uganda. Thank you for your time and for sharing your, your insights on the, 
on this report and uh, and generally speaking on the African financial sector in these turbulent times. Uh, so thank you. You have uh, the contact on the slides if you want to reach out for additional questions. Thank you very much for joining the webinar today and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.